Chapter 35 of On Everything. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Everything by Hilaire Belloc, the Missioner. In one of those great halls which the winter darkens and which are proper to the north, there sat a group of men kindly and full of the winter night and of their food and drink, upon which for many hours they had regaled together, and not only full of song, but satiated with it, so long and so loudly had they sung. They all claimed descent from the gods, but in varying degrees, and their chief was descended from the father of the gods, by no doubtful lineage, for it was his grandfather's mother to whom a witch in the woods had told the story of her birth. In the midst of them, as they sat, a large fire smoldered, but having been long lit, sent up so strong a shaft of rising air as drew all smoke with it, towering to a sort of open cage upon the high roof tree of that hall, whence it could escape to heaven. I say they were tired of song and filled with many good things, but chiefly with companionship. They had landed but recently from the sea. The noise of the sea was in their ears as they so sat round the fire, still talking low, and a priest who was among them refused to interpret the sound. But he said in a manner that some mocked doubtfully, others heard with awe, that the sea never sounded save upon nights when the gods were abroad. He was the priest of a lesser god, but he was known throughout the fleet of those pirate fishermen for his great skill in the interpretation of dreams." and he could tell by the surface of the water in the nightless midsummer where the shoals were to be found. He said that on that night the gods were abroad, and indeed the quality of the wind as it came down the gulf of the fjord provoked such a fancy, for it rose and fell as though by a volition and sometimes one would have said that it was a quiet night, and again a moment after one heard a noise like the voice round the corners of the great beams, and the wind pitied or appealed or called. Then a man who was a serf, but very skilled in woodwork, lying among the serfs in the outer ring beyond the fire and the straw, called up and said, Lords, he is right. The gods have come down from the Dover field. They are abroad. Let us bless our doors. It was when he had so spoken that upon the main gate of the hall a large double engine of foot-thick pine swung upon hinges wrought many generations ago by the sons of the gods came a little knocking. It was a little tapping, like the tapping of a bird. It rang musically of metal and of hollow metal. It moved them, curiously. And a very young man, who was of the blood, said to his father, Perhaps a god would warn us. The keeper of the door was a huge and kindly man, foolish but good for lifting with whom by daylight children played, and who upon such evenings lay silent and contented enough to hear his wittier fellows. This serf rose from the straw and went to on bar, but the chief put his hand forward and bade him stay, that they might still hear that little tapping. Then he lowered his hand, and the gate was swung open. Cold came with it for a moment, and the night air, light and as though blown before that draft, drifted into the hall a tall man, very young, who bowed to them with a gesture they did not know, 
and first asked in a tongue they could not tell whether any man might interpret for him. Then one old man, who was their pilot, and who had often run down into the vineyard lands, sometimes for barter, sometimes for war, always for a wage, said two words or three in that new tongue, hesitatingly. His face was wrinkled and hard. He had very bright but very pale gray eyes that were full of humility. He said three words of greeting which he had painfully learned twenty years before from a priest upon the rocks of Brittany who had also given him smooth stones wherewith to pray. And with these smooth stones the old pilot continually prayed, sometimes to the greater and sometimes to the lesser gods. His wife had died during the first war between Herolf and the twin brothers. He had come home to find her dead and sanctified, and, being northern, he had since been also a silent man. This pilot, I say, quoted the words of greeting in the strange tongue. Then the tall young stranger man advanced into the circle of the firelight and made a sign upon his head and his breast and his shoulders, which was like the sign of the hammer of Thor, and yet which was not the sign of the hammer of Thor. When he had done this, the pilot attempted the same sign, but he failed at it, for it was many years since he had been taught it upon the Breton coast. He knew it to be magical and beneficent, and he was ashamed to fail. The chief of those who were descended from the gods and were seated round the fire turned to the priest and said, Is this a guest, a stranger sent, or is he a man come as an enemy who should be let out again into the night? Have you any divination? I have no divination, said the priest. I cannot tell one thing or the other, nor each from the other in the case of this young man. But perhaps he is one of the gods seeking shelter among men. Or perhaps... He is a fancy thing, a warlock, but not doing evil. Or perhaps he is from the demons. Or perhaps he is a man like ourselves and seeking shelter during some long wandering. When the chief heard this, he asked the pilot, not as a man possessing divine knowledge, but as one who had traveled and knew the sea, whether he knew this stranger and whence he came. To which the pilot answered, Captain, I do not know this young man, nor whence he comes, nor any of his tribe, nor have I seen any like him, save once three slaves who stood in a marketplace of the Romans, in a town that was subject to a great lord who was a Frank and not a Breton and who was hated by the people of his town, so that later they slew him. Then these three slaves were loosened, and they came to the house of the priest of the gods of that country, and they told me the name of the people whence they sprang, but I have forgotten it. Only I know that it is among the vineyard lands, there the day and the night are equally divided all the year long. And if the snow falls, it falls gently and for a very little while. And there are all manner of birds, and those people are very rich, and they have great houses of stone. Now I believe this stranger to be a man like ourselves, born of a woman, and coming northward upon some purpose which we do not know. It may be for merchandise, or it may be for the love of singing and of telling stories to men. 
When he had said this, they all looked at the stranger, and they saw that he had with him a little instrument that was not known to them. For it was a flute of metal. It was of silver, as they could see, long drawn and very delicately made. And with this had he summoned at the gate. The chief then brought out with his own hands a carven chair on which he seated the stranger, and he put into his right hand a gold cup taken from the Romans in a city of the Franks, upon which was faintly carved a cross, and round the rim of which were four precious stones, an emerald, a ruby, an amethyst, and a diamond. And, Going to a skin which he had taken in a Gascon raid, he poured out wine into that chalice, and went down upon one knee, as is proper to strangers when they are to be entertained, and put a cloth over his arms, and bade him drink. But when the young man saw the cross faintly carved upon the cup, and the four precious stones at the corner of it, he shuddered a little, and put it aside as though it were a sacred thing, at which they all marveled. Yet he longed for the wine, and they, understanding that in some way this ornament was sacred to his gods, gently took it from him, and through courtesy put it aside, upon a separate place which was reserved for honorable vessels." and poured him another wine into a wooden stoop, and this he drank, holding it out now to one and now to another, but last and chiefly to their captain. And as he drank it, he drank it with signs of amity. Then, by way of payment for so much kindness, he took his silver flute and blew upon it shrill notes, all very sweet and the sweeter for their choice and distance one from another, until they listened, listening every man, with those beside him like one man, for they had never heard such a sound. And as he played, one man saw one thing in his mind, and one another thing. For one man saw the long and easy summer seas that roll after a prosperous boat filled with spoil whether of fishes or of booty, when the square sail is taken aft by a warm wind in the summer season, and the high mountains of home first show beyond the line of the sea. And another man saw a little valley, narrow with deep pasture, wherein he had been bred and had learned to plough the land with horses before ever he had come to the handling of a tiller or the bursting of water upon the boughs. And another saw no distant or certain thing, but vague and pleasurable hopes fulfilled, and the advent of great peace. And another saw those heights of the hills to which he ever desired to return. But the old pilot, straining with wonder in his eyes as the music rose, thought confusedly of all that he had seen and known, of the twirling tides upon the Breton coast and of the great stone towns, of the bright vestments of the ordered armies in the marketplaces and of the vineyard land. When the stranger had ceased so to play upon his instrument, they applauded, as their custom was, by cries, some striking the armor upon the ground so that it rang, and by gesture and voice they begged him play again. The second time he played, all those men heard one thing, which was a dance of young men and women together in some country where there was little fear. The tune went softly and was softly repeated, full of the lilt of feet, and when it was ended they knew that the dance was done. This time they were so pleased that they waited a little before they would applaud. But the old pilot, remembering more strongly than ever the vineyard land, moved his right hand back and forth with delight, as in some way he would play music with it, 
and thus, by a communication of heart to heart, stirred in that stranger a new song. And taking up his flute for the third time, he blew upon it a different strain, at which some were confused, others hungry in their hearts, though they could not have told you why. But the old pilot saw great and gracious figures moving over a land subject to blessedness. He saw that in the faces of these figures, which were those of the immortals, stood present at once a complete satisfaction and a joyous energy and a solution of every ill. These he said to himself in the last passion of the music, These are true gods. But suddenly the music ceased, and with it the vision also. For the great pleasure which the fruit player had given them, they desired to keep him in their company, and so they did for three full years. That is, the winter long, the seed time, and the time of harvest, and the next harvest also, and another harvest more, during which time he played them many tunes, and learnt their tongue. Now his gods were his own, but he pined for the lack of their worship, and for priests of his own sort. And when he would explain these in his own manner, some believed him, but some did not believe him. And to those who believed him, he brought a man from the south, from beyond the Dovrefeld, who baptized them with water. As for those who would not have this, they looked on and kept to their own decree. But there was as yet no division among them. A little while after the third harvest, hearing that the fleet, which was of twelve boats, would make for Roman land, he begged to go with it, for he was sick for his own. But first he made them take an oath that they would molest none, nor even barter with any, until they had landed him in his own land. The chief took this oath for them, and, though his oath was worth the oath of twelve men, twelve other men swore with him. In this way, the oath was done. So they took the flute player for three days over the sea before the wind called Eager, which is the northeast wind, and blows at the beginning of the open season. They took him at the beginning of the fourth year since his coming among them and they landed him in a little boat in a seaport of the Franks on Roman land. The faith went over the world as very light seed goes upon the wind, and no one knows the drift on which it blew. It came to one place and to another, and to each in a different way. It came not to many men, but always to one heart, till all men had hold of it. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 of On Everything This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Everything by Hilaire Belloc, The Dream The experience I am about to set down was perhaps the result, and at any rate it was the sequel, of a conversation engaged between three men in London in the year 1903. Of these three men, one was returned but recently from South Africa, where he had seen all too much of the war. Another was a kindly, wealthy, sober sort of man, young, virtuous, and full of inquiry. The third was a hack. It was about the season of Easter and of spring, 
when actually and physically one can feel and handle the force of life about one, all ready to break bounds. But these young men, for no one of them was yet of middle age, preferred to talk of things more shadowy and less certain than the air and the life and the English spring all around. Things more shadowy and less certain, but to the mind of youth, being a vigorous mind, things fixed and absorbing. Destiny, for instance, and the nature of man. Not one of these three, however, affirmed in this conversation, uh, which I so well remember, any definite scheme. They spoke in terms of violent opinion, of argument, and of analogy, but none of the three came forward with a faith, or even with a philosophy from which one felt he could not be shaken. The more remarkable was it, therefore, that one of them, on his return in the early morning to his rooms, after this young and long conversation of a mixed sort, such as men entering upon life will often indulge, should have suffered and should have remembered an exact and even terrible vision. It would indeed be inexplicable that he should have suffered such a thing as a consequence of his waking thoughts, though if there be influences upon minds other than the influences they themselves can bring, uh, if there be influences from without, and other wills determining our dreams, then what next followed is less difficult to comprehend. For, when he had fallen asleep, it seemed to him at once that he was in the midst of a very gay and pleasant company, in a sort of palace, where of the vast room in which he stood was one out of very many that opened one into the other in sequence. The crowd, and he with it, went forward slowly towards a banquet which he heard was prepared. He did not see among those he spoke to, and who spoke to him, any face with which he was familiar, or to which he could attach a name, and yet he seemed to know them all. In that curious in consequence of dreams, and one in especial, at some distance from him, which seemed to have been lost once, and now to be seen again through the crowd, was a face, the sight of which moved in him a very passionate memory. Yet, It was no early memory. So they went forward, and soon they were all seated at a table of enormous length, so long that its length seemed to have some purpose about it. And at the farther end of this table was a door leading out of that hall. It was a door not very large for so magnificent a space, such a door as a man or woman could easily open with a common gesture and pass through and shut behind them quickly. Now for the first time, when they were eating and drinking, it seemed to him that the conversation took on meaning, and a more consecutive meaning than is usual in dreams. When, Just as that new phase of his dream had begun, one of the guests, a little to the left of the place opposite to him, a woman of middle age who had been somewhat silent, rose without apology, and without warning left her place, he hardly knew how, and passed out of the room through the door that he had noticed. It shut behind her. No one mentioned or noticed her going. But in a little while, another and another had risen and had gone. And still as each guest departed, some in the midst of a sentence, some during a silence in the talk, there increased upon him an appalling sense of unusual things. 
It was appalling to him that no one said goodbye, that none of the fellows of those who so departed turned to them or noticed their going, and that none of those who so departed returned or made any promise to return. Next, he noticed with an increasing ill ease, by some inconsequence of his dream, that when he watched the departure of a guest, as the others did not, he saw the empty chair and the gap left in the ranks. But when he looked again after speaking to some other, to the right or left, the gap was somehow less defined. And when he looked yet again, it was no longer to be noticed or perceived. Though it could not be said that the chair was filled or was removed, but in some way the absence of the man or woman who had been there ceased to be marked. And it was as though they had never been present at all. It was not often that he cared to look for more than a moment at one or another of these risings from the feast. Yet, in the moment's observation, he could see very different things. Some rose as though in terror, some as though in weariness, some startled as at a sudden command which they alone could hear, some in a natural manner, as though at an appointed moment. But there was no order or method in their going. Only all went through that door. His mind was now oppressed by the change which comes in dreams and turns them sometimes from fantasy to horror. There sat opposite him a man, somewhat older than himself, with a face vigorous and yet despairing, not without energy and trained in self-command. And this man answered his thoughts at once, as thoughts are answered in dreams. He said that it was of no use wondering why any guest left that feast, nor what there was, if there was anything, beyond the door through which this inconsequential passage was made. Even as he was saying this, he himself, suddenly looking towards it with an expression of extreme sadness and abandonment, rose abruptly, bowed to no one, and went out. At his departure, the dreamer heard a little sigh. And he who had sighed said that doors of their nature led from one place to another. And then he tittered a little as though he had said a clever thing. Then another, a large happy man, laughed somewhat too loudly and said that only fools discussed what none could know. A third, still upon that same theme, said in a fixed, contented manner that in the nature of things nothing was beyond the door. At which the first who had spoken tittered again and said, Doors of their nature led somewhere. Even as he said it, his eyes filled with tears, and he also rose and went out. For the first time during this increasing pressure of mystery and disaster, for so the dreamer felt it, he watched the figure of that guest. None of his companions about him dared or chose to do so. But the dreamer fixedly watched, and he saw the figure going down the long perspective of the hall very rapidly and very directly. It did not hesitate nor look back for one moment. It passed through. It was gone. The dreamer suddenly felt the wine of that feast, the words spoken round him, more full of meaning and of novelty. The noise of speech, though more confused, was more pleasing and louder. The candles were far more bright. 
He had forgotten, or was just forgetting, all that other mood of his dream when it seemed to him that, in a sense, all that converse was struck dumb. He heard no sound. He was cut off. Their hands still moved, their eyes and lips framed words and repeated glances, but around him and for him there was silence. The candles burned bright through the length of the room, and brightest as in a guiding manner towards the end of it where was the door. He felt a thrill pass from his face. He rose and walked directly, no one speaking to him or noticing him at all, down the long, narrow space behind their chairs. It took him but a moment, innumerable as were those whom he must pass. His hand was upon the latch, with his head bent forward somewhat and downwards in the attitude of a man hurrying. He passed through, and not knowing what he did, but doing it as though by habit, he shut the door between him and the feast, and immediately he was in a complete and utterly silent darkness. But he still was. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 of On Everything. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Tommy Hersant, Carlsbad, California. On Everything by Hilaire Bullock. The Silence of the Battlefields. Whoever has had occasion, whether for study or for curiosity, to visit many of the battlefields of Europe, must have been especially struck by their silence. There are many things combining to produce this impression, but when all have been accounted for, something over remains. Thus it is true that in any countryside the contrast between the noise of the great fight that fills one's mind and the natural calm of woods and of fields must penetrate the mind. And again, it is evident that any piece of land which one closely examines, noting all its details for the purposes of history, must seem more lonely and deserted than those general views in which the eye comprehends so much of the work of man. Because all this special watching of particular corners, noting of ranges and the rest, makes one's progress slow. Keep one's eyes close fixed to things more or less near, and thus allow one to appreciate how far between men are, save in the towns. But there is more than this. It can be proved that there is more. For the same sense of complete loneliness does not take a man in other similar work. He does not feel it when he is surveying for a map, nor when he is searching for an historic site other than that of battle. But the battlefields are lonely. Some few, especially in this crowded island, are not lonely. Life has overtaken them, spreading outwards from the towns. By what curious irony, for instance, the race course at Luz, with a shouting throng of men as the horses go by, corresponds precisely to the place where must have been the thickest of the advance on Montfort's right as he led them to attack the king. Evesham is not lonely. Battle is full of houses and of villas, and the chief center of the fight is in a garden. But for the most part, the great battlefields are lonely, and their loneliness is unnatural and oppressive. In some way, they repel men. Trasimene is the lonely shore of a marsh. One would imagine that a place so famous would be in some way visited, 
one of the great sewers of cosmopolitan travel runs close by. One would imagine that the historic interest of the place would bring men from that railway to the shore upon which so very nearly the Orientals destroyed us. There is no such publicity. Sitting at evening near those reeds where the great fight was fought, one has a feeling, rare in Italy, commoner in the north, of complete isolation. There is nothing but water in the evening sky, and it is so mournful that one might imagine it a place to which things doomed would come to die. Run Sesveils, which means so little in the military history of Europe, and so much in her literature, is a profound gorge, cleft right into the earth three thousand feet, and clothed with such mighty beech woods that for these alone, apart from its history, one might imagine it to be perpetually visited. It is not visited. No house is near it, save the huddled huts round the gloomy place of pilgrimage upon the farther side of the pass. A silence more profound, a sense of recession more complete, is not to be discovered upon any of the great roads of Europe, for one of the great roads goes by the place where Roland died, but very few travel along it. Toulouse is popular and noisy, surrounded by so many small market gardens and so busy and humming a southern life, detestable to quiet men, that you might think no sight near it was touched with loneliness. But there is such a sight. It is the crest beyond the city where Wellington's victory was won. More curious still, Waterloo at the very gates of Brussels, within a stone's throw, one may say, of building sites for suburbs, is the only lonely place in its neighborhood. That valley, or rather that little dip, which is so great in military history, and yet which did so little to change the general movement of the world, is the one deserted set of fields that you can find for a long way round. And of the soil of Belgium, a gridiron of railways stuffed with industry, a place where one short walk takes you from a town to a town anywhere throughout the little state, is still remarkable for the way in which its battlefields seem to fend off the presence of man. The plateau of Fleurus, the marshy banks of Jamaps, the roll of Nierwinden, all illustrate what I mean. If one considers in what two places since Christendom was Christendom, most was done to save Christendom from destruction, one will fix upon the Catalonian fields, and upon that low tableland in the fork of the two rivers between Poitiers and Tours, in the first, Attila was broken, Asia from the east, and the second, the Mohammedan, Asia from the south. The Catalonian fields have bleakness amazing to the traveler. Nothing, perhaps, so near so much wealth is so utterly alone. Great folds of empty land that will grow little, that only lately were planted with stunted pine trees, that they might at least grow something, weary the eye. One dead straight road, Roman in origin, Gallic in its continents, drives right across the waste. It is there that the Huns were broken. It is from that point that their sullen retreat eastward was permitted as was permitted in 1792, the retreat eastward of the royal armies from their check in that same plain at Valmy. And Valmy also is intensely lonely. A bare bridge despoiled today even of its mill, and the little chapel raised to the soul of Kellerman hides itself away so that you do not see it 
until you are close upon the place. Poitier has the same loneliness. The Mohammedan had ridden up from the Pyrenees, ricocheted from the walls of Toulouse, but poured on like a flood into the center of Gaul. Charles the Hammer broke him in the fields beyond Vunoy. The district is populous, and the valley of the Clain is full of pastures and among the tenderest of European valleys. But as you drift downstream and approach this place, the plateau upon the right above you grows bare. And it was there, so far as modern scholarship can be certain, that the last effort of the Arabs was forced back. The other battles of Poitiers, among the vineyards, the Black Prince's battle, one would imagine, could not seem lonely, for it was fought in the midst of tilled land full of vineyards, and right above the great high road which leads southeast from the town. But lonely it is, and if you will go up the little gully where the head of the French column advanced against the English archers upon the high land above, you will not find a man to tell you the memories of the place. Cressy was fought close to a county town, but the same trick of landscape or of influence is also played there. The town hides itself in a little hollow upon the farther flank of a hill, and, though the right of Edward's line reposed upon it, and though it was within a bowshot of the houses that the boy his son was pressed so hard, yet Crissy hides away from the battlefield, and as you come in by the eastern road, which takes you all along the crest of the English position, there is nothing before you but a naked and a silent land, falling in a dip to where the first of the French charge failed, and rising in long empty lengths of fallow and of grass to where you can see a single mark for the eye in so much loneliness. The rude cross standing on the place where the blind king of Bohemia fell. Loneliest of all, with a loneliness which perpetually haunts me whenever I write of it, is that battlefield which I know best and have most closely studied. It is the battlefield on which, as I believe, more was done to affect both military and general history than on any other, the battlefield of Watigny. Here the revolution certainly stood, to go under with the fall of Maubeuge, which was at the last gasp for food, or with the raising of that siege to go forward. By the success at Watigny, the siege was raised. In military history also it is of great account, for at Watigny was the first time the great mind of Carnot, the darting, aquiline mind of that man whose school of tactics produced Napoleon, first dealt with an army. At Watigny, for the first time, the concentration at the fullest expense of fatigue, of overwhelming force upon one point of the objective, came into play and was successful. Such tactics needed the infantry, which, as a fact, were used in their development. Still, they were new. Now, Watigny, where so much was done to change the art of war and to transform Europe, is as lonely as anything on earth. Lines of high trees, a wood almost uncultivated, a rare thing in France, a swept wintry upland without a house or a barn, a little huddled group of poor steedings round a tiny church, and against it all the while rain and hard weather driving from the French plains below. That is Watigny. Up through those sunken ways by which Dachenoy's division charged, you will not meet a single human being. And 
that heath over which the immigrant nobles countercharged for the last time under the white flag, is similarly bereft of men. Nowhere do you feel the unnatural loneliness of those haunted places of honor than in this which I believe to be the chief one of all the European fields. End of chapter 37「When the mind impelled by forces not its own demands the expansion or the lessening of time. Thus, in a moment, as the foolish physicist can prove, long experiences of dreams are held, and thus hours upon hours of other men's lives are lost to us forever when we lie in profound sleep. And I knew a man who sleeping through a morning upon the grassy side of a hill many years ago, slept through news that seemed to have ruined him and his, and slept on to a later moment when the news proved false and the threat of disaster was lifted. During those hours of agony, there had been for him no time. They say that with men approaching dissolution, some trick of time is played, or at least that when death is very near, indeed the whole scale and structure of thought changes, just as some have imagined, and it is a reasonable suspicion, that the common laws governing matter do not apply to it in some last stage of tenuity. So the ordered sequence of the mind takes on something fantastic and moves during such moments in a void. So must it have been with that which I will now describe. A man lay upon a bed of a common sort in a room which was bare of ornament, but he had forgotten the room. He was a man of middle age, corpulent, and one whose flesh and the skin of whose flesh had sagged under disease. His eyes were closed, his mouth, which was very fine, delicate, and firm, alone of his features preserved its rigor. Those features had been square and massive. Their squareness and their strength, the more emphasized by the high forehead with its one wisp of hair. But though the strength of character remained behind the face, the muscular strength had left it, for that body had suffered agony. The man so lying was conscious of little. The external world was already beyond his reach. He knew that somehow he was not suffering pain, and the mortal fatigue that oppressed him had, in that unexpected absence of pain, some opportunity for repose. Neither his room, nor what was left of companionship round him, nor the voices that he knew and loved, nor those others that he knew too well and despised, reached his senses. For many years, the air in which he had lived and in which he was now perishing had been to him in his captivity a mournful delight. It was a tropical air, but enlivened by the freshness of the sea and continually impelled in great sea winds above him. Now he felt that air no longer and might have been so many thousand miles away in the place where he had been born or many thousand miles more, in the snows of a great campaign, or under the violent desert sun of certain remembered battles. It was all one to him, for he only held to life by one thread within, and outer things had already left him. Within, however, his mind in that last weakness still busily turned, no longer considering as it had considered during the activity of a marvelous life, what answers the great questions propounded to the soul of man should receive. 
still less noting practical and immediate needs or considering set problems. His mind for once, almost for the first time, was this last time seeing things go by. First, he saw dull pageantries, which had been the common stuff of his life, and he was confused by half-remembered, half-restored, faint cheers of distant crowds, colors, and gold, and the twin flashes of gems and steel. And through it now and then, strains of solemn music, and now and then the tearing cry of bronze, the bugles. All these sensations, confused and blurred, re-arose, and as they re-arose, welling up into him like a mist, there re-arose those permanent concomitants of such things. He felt again the nervous dread of folly and mishap, wondered upon the correctness of his conduct, whether he had not given offense somewhere to someone, whether he had not been the subject of criticism by some tongue he feared. And as all that part of his great life returned to him, his face, even in that extremity, showed some faint traces of concern, such as it had borne when in truth, and in the body he had moved in the midst of a court. Next, like shadows disappearing, all that ghostly hubbub passed. But before he could be alone, another picture succeeded, and he thought to feel beneath him the rolling of the sea. He was a young man looking for land, with others standing behind upon the deck, watching him in envy because of the miracles he was to do with armed men when he should touch the shore. And yet he was not a young man. He was a man already weighted with disappointment and with loss of love and with some confused conception of breaking under an immense strain. And those who were on the deck behind him watching him watched him with awe and pity and with a sort of dread that did not relieve his spirit. So young and old in the same moment, he felt in the brain the swinging of a ship's deck. So he strained for land, a land where he should conquer, and at the same time it was a land where he should be utterly alone, and utterly forget, and be filled with nothing but defeat. The contradictions held him altogether. Then this movement also steadied and changed, and he had the sensation of a man walking up some steep hill, some hill too steep. He was leading a horse, and the horse stumbled. It was bitterly cold, but he did not feel the cold, the roaring and the driving round him in the snow. Next, he was in the saddle. There was a little eminence from which he saw a plain. Slight as the beast was his seat galled him. He sat his mount badly, and he dreaded lest it should start with him as it had started the day before. But even as he so worried himself on his bad horsemanship, all his mind changed at quite another sight. For in the plain below that little height, the great battalions went forward, rank upon rank upon rank. It was a review, and it was a battle, and it was a campaign. Mad imagery. The uniforms were the uniforms of Gala. The drum majors went before the companies of the guard, gigantic, twirling their gigantic staves. The lifted trumpets of the cuirassiers sounded as though upon some great stage, for the mere glory of the sound. And mass upon mass, regular, Instinct with purpose, innumerable, the army passed below. There was no end to it. He knew he was certain, as he strained his eyes, that it would never end. It was a foot, and it would march forever. Far off, beyond the line, upon the flank of it, distant and terrible went the packed mass of the guns, and you could hear faintly amid the other noises of the advance the clatter clank clank of the limber. And from so far off he saw the leading sabers of commanders saluting him from his old arm. Here again was a mixture for him of things that do not mix in the true world, glory and despair. 
This endless army was his, and yet would go on beyond him. It was his and not his. There was room upon the colors for a million names of victories, but every victory in some way carried the stamp of defeat. And yet seeing all the pageant as the precursor of failure, he also saw it as something constructive. He thought of wood that burns and is consumed, but is the fuel of a flame of fire and all that fire can do. As he so thought, like a wind and a spirit blowing through the hole came some vast conception of a god. And once again the mixed, the dual feeling seized him, more greatly than before. It was a god that drove them all, and him. And that god was in his childhood, and he remembered his childhood very clearly. It was something of which he had been convinced in childhood, a security of good. Look how the army moved! And now it had halted. Here his mind failed, and he had died. It was Napoleon. End of chapter 38、Chapter、39 Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. On Everything by Hilaire Belloc. On Rest. There was a priest once who preached a sermon to the text of, of Abba, Father. On that text, one might preach anything, but the matter that he chose was rest. He was not yet in middle age, and those who heard him were not yet even young. They could not understand at all the moment of his ardent speech, and even the older men, seeing him to be but in the central part of life, wondered that he should speak so. His eyes were illuminated by the vision of something distant. His heart was not ill at ease, but, as it were, fixedly expectant, and he preached from his little pulpit in that little chapel of the Downs, with rising and deeper powers of the voice, so that he shook the air. Yet all this energy was but the praise or the demand for the surcease of energy, and all this sound was but the demand for silence. It is a thing, I say, incomprehensible to the young, but gradually comprehended as the years go droning by, that in all things, and in proportion to the intensity of the life of each, there comes this appetite for dissolution and for repose. I do not mean that repose beyond which further effort is demanded, but something final and supreme. This priest, a year or so after he had appealed with his sermon before that little country audience in the emptiness of the Downs, died. He had that which he desired rest. But what is it? What is the nature of this thing? Note you how great soldiers, when their long campaigns are done, Are indifferent to further war, and look largely upon the nature of fighting men, their objects, their failures, their victories, their rallying, their momentary cheer. Not that they grow indifferent to that great trade which is the chief business of a state, the defense or the extension of the common weal, but that after so much expense of all the senses our God gave them, his sort of charity and justice fills their minds. I have often remarked how men who had most lost and won, even in arms, would turn the leisured part of their lives to the study of the details of the struggle, and seemed equally content to be describing the noble fortunes of an army, whether it were upon the crest of advancing victory or in the agony of a surrender. This was because the writers had found rest, and throughout the history of the letters of civilization and of contemporary friends, One may say that in proportion to the largeness of their action is this largeness and security of vision at the end. Now, note another thing that when we speak of an end, by that very word we mean two things. First, we mean the cessation of form and perhaps of idea, but also we mean a goal or object to which the form and the idea perpetually tended, without which they would have had neither meaning nor existence. And in which they were at last fulfilled. Aristotle could give no summing up but this to all his philosophy that there was a nature 
not only of all but of each and that the end determined what the nature might be which is also what we christians mean when we say that god made the world and great rabelais when his great books were ending could but conclude that all things tended to their end tennyson also before he died having written for so many years of poetry which one must be excused in believing considerable felt as how many have felt it the thrumming of the ebb tide when the sea calls back the feudal alliance of the rivers i know it upon Oran bar the flood which the sea heaves up and pours itself into the inland channels bears itself creatively and is like the manhood of a man first tentative then gathering itself for action then sweeping suddenly at the charge it carries with it the wind from the open horizon it determines suddenly it spurs and sweeps and is victorious the current races the harbor is immediately full but the ebb tide is of another kind with a long slow power whose motive is at once downward steadily towards its authority and its obedience and desire it pushes as with shoulders home and for many hours the stream goes darkly swiftly and steadily it is intent direct and level it is a thing for evenings and it is under an evening when there is a little wind that you may best observe the symbol thus presented by material things for everything in nature has in it something sacramental teaching the soul of man and nothing more possesses that high quality than the motion of a river when it meets the sea the water at last hangs dully the work is done and those who have permitted the lesson to instruct their minds are aware of consummation men living in cities have often wondered how it was that the men in the open who knew horses and the earth or ships and the salt water risked so much and for what reward it is an error in the very question they ask rather than in the logical puzzle they approach which falsifies their wonder there is no reward to die in battle to break one's neck at a hedge to sink or to be swamped are not rewards but action demands an end there is a fruit to things and everything we do here at least and within the bonds of time may not exceed the little limits of a nature which it neither made nor acquired for itself but was granted some say that old men fear death it is the theme of the debased and the vulgar it is not true those who have imperfectly served are ready enough those who have served more perfectly are glad as though there stood before them a natural transition and a condition of their being so it says in a book all good endings are but shining transitions and again there is a sonnet which says we will not whisper we have found the place a silence and the ancient halls of sleep and that which breathes alone throughout the deep the end and the beginning and the face between the level brows of whose blind eyes lie plenary contentment full surcease of violence and the ultimate great peace wherein we lose our human lullabies look up and tell the immeasurable height between the vault of the world and your dear head that's death my little sister and the night that was our mother beckons us to bed where large lip oblivion in her house is laid for as tired children now our games are played indeed one might quote the poets who are the teachers of mankind indefinitely in this regard they are all agreed what did sleep and death to the body of sarbaton they took it home and every one who dies in all the epics is better for the dying some complain of it afterwards i will admit but they are hard to please roland took it as the end of battle and there was a scandinavian fellow caught on the northeast coast i think who in dying thanked god for all the joy he had had in his life as you may have heard before and saint anthony of assisi not of padua said welcome little sister death as was his way and one who stands right above most men who write or speak said it was the only port after the tide streams and bar handling of this journey so it is let us be off to the hills the silence and immensity that inhabit them are the simulacra of such things william brendan and son limited printers plymouth end of chapter thirty nine end of 
On Everything by Hilaire Bellick.